Praise the Lord, everybody. Pastor Nick here with another devotion from the book of Psalm. So glad that you can join me uh, this morning and every morning at 7 a.m. Uh, we hope that you are enjoying these videos and they're being a blessing to you. Hope that you're learning and uh, growing from them as I am through this particular process. If you haven't done so, please like, share, and subscribe. Um, also comment in there, uh, help a brother out, and share, the, share this with somebody. Uh, get somebody to join the journey um, as we continue to work through this book during this uh, very interesting time in history. Uh, if you're new, welcome to uh, the journey and uh, we hope you enjoy these videos that are coming out. If you missed any, of course, you can go back on my page and go watch them. Follow me on my platforms. The information is on the screen. Of course, follow the church at BBC of NJ and follow our bishop at David G. Evans 1. Now, um, we are in Psalm 45, and this particular psalm is pretty interesting because it has a imagery to it that is not very straightforward. So I'm going to kind of do this a little bit differently than I do the rest. The rest is more, you know, line by line. But I want to kind of talk to you about the concepts and then highlight some particular verses. Now, when you're reading Psalm 45, you know, it starts talking about this wedding scenario. It's a wedding theme. It's a royal wedding song, a ceremony at a wedding time and uh, a, a, excuse me, a song, a royal wedding song that celebrates this coming together. Now, when you're interpreting scripture, uh, whether it's Genesis, all the way through Revelations, whatever book, you want to make sure that you see Jesus in the books of the Bible. The Bible says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. The whole book is about him. He's in the pages. He's in the chapters. He is in the verses. Um, so when we look at this particular uh, chapter 45, we want to see Jesus in it and interpret it from the lens point of who he is. So the writer uh, who is Korah, the Levite, uh, begins to write in verse one down to verse number six, I mean verse five, excuse me. And it's talking about the greatness of this individual celebrating the king, um, describing the king's greatness and introducing the king to the world that Jesus is our great king. He is the king. He has a kingdom. And soon he is going to marry his bride, who is the church. All right. Um, the great supper, the great marriage supper of the lamb in the book of Revelation is when Jesus comes together finally and seals the deal with his bride, who is the church, because Jesus is coming for his bride. That's why you see uh, these bride, bridegroom, bride scenarios in scripture. For example, when they were lighting the uh, when they were waiting for the bridegroom to come and they had the oil and some didn't have enough oil. The bridegroom came showing us that Jesus is coming for his church. It's going to come a time where there's going to be a coming together. So this psalm really highlights that principle and that great hope that all of us have as the church that one day we will be fully and finally be with Jesus. Right now we're with him just in a spiritual sense, but one day physically we will all be together in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he is that bridegroom that's coming that we anticipate him like the 10 virgins. And we got to make sure that we're ready because we don't know when. We don't know when he is going to arrive. We just have to be ready. We don't know when Jesus is coming. We just have to be always ready because the bridegroom is coming. And he starts talking about describing the, uh, the, the king in verse 1 through 5. And he says in verse 6, your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. All right. And he says in your royal scepter is a scepter of equity. You love righteousness and hate wickedness that God is the king. He reigns forever and no one can stop his throne from no one can stop him from reigning on the throne. There is no coup that can take him out. There is no demon, no devil that can stop God. God is our king forever. And watch this. He works in equity. He loves righteous, hates the wicked. 
he, 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 he disperses to people according to their behavior and who they are. Remember, God is not a respecter of persons. He is a respecter of principle. If you follow the principle, you will get the results. He goes on to say that, therefore, God, your God has anointed you, talking about Jesus, with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. The oil of gladness, your robes and your fragrance with myrrh and aloes and cassia from the ivory palace of string instruments make you glad. And he starts talking about all this stuff about the greatness of this king who is Jesus. And then in verse number 10, he starts talking. It says, Hear, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. He shifts the conversation to the church, to his bride. That watch this. If you're going to be with Jesus, it's going to cost you some things. I know people love this, uh, this relationship with God with no cost to it, but that's not biblical. There is a price to pay to follow Jesus. So he talks about this bride. He shows us this bride coming into the king and he gives instructions. There are some people like Abraham you have to come out of. And he starts describing uh, uh, people seeking favor and riches with all the kinds of wealth. And the princess is decked with her chambers with golden woven robes and many color robes. She's led up to the king. Again, this great ceremony. Watch this. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter uh, five that the husband nourishes, cherishes and prepares the bride. Jesus is a part of the process of preparing his bride to come to him. He's working on us. So as Paul says, we'll be without spot or wrinkle. He's ironing out the wrinkles. He's cleaning the spots off. So when we come to him, we will come to him ready and prepared. He talks about, behold, the virgins, the companions follow with joy and gladness. There's this great celebration as the king and the bride come together. And he closes it off in verse 16. It says, in the place of ancestors, you, O king, shall have sons and will make them princes in all the earth. That through this relationship, their sons are going to be born through the church, through the relationship between Jesus and the church. A nation is going to be born called the people of God. He says in verse 17, he closes out, I will cause your name to be celebrated in all generations. Therefore, the people will praise you forever and ever. Jesus is celebrated in all generations. And there's going to be a day where all of the people will have to bow down. All of the people will have to acknowledge and will have to admit that Jesus is the Savior and he is the King. People on earth now may not want to do it, but one day we will all crown him king. One day, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Church, prepare yourself. One day he's coming back like a thief in the night. In the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, with the shout of the archangel, whether you're amillennial, postmillennial, premillennial, we don't worry about it. You can look it up later. Whenever Jesus comes back, he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And our job is to celebrate him in this coming together. And that's our great hope as Christians, that even though this life may have its challenges, our great hope is that one day and the restoration of all things, we will be with the God that created us, the God that redeemed us in a great relationship with him. The church is engaged to him now, but one day we will be married and we will celebrate all together in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Come on, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for who you are. Uh, thank you for doing us like you did Abraham, for calling us out. Uh, there were some things that we were in, some people we were around that you called us out of. And Father, I thank you today for how you have um, allowed us to hear your voice. You spoke and you put it in us to hear you. And I thank you, Lord, that when we didn't listen the first couple of times, you kept calling us until we came to you. Thank you for that great mercy, that great love that continues to pursue us. Even when we run away, even when we rebel, we thank you that your commitment is to us. So, Father, I pray in Jesus name that you would continue to work on us, continue to iron out the wrinkles and blot out our transgressions and 
remove those stains that one day, Lord, you'll bring us to you. Thank you for that great hope that even in the world where there's a whole lot of calamity and a whole lot of trouble, our great hope is that one day we will be with you where the line will lay down by the lamb, where there will be peace and light forevermore and no more darkness. I pray, Lord, for each person that's watching this, that you would keep them, protect them, hold on to them, Lord. We look to you. You are the hope of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. See you tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock again for the journey. See you later.